Well, good morning, everybody, um, or afternoon, depending on where you might be. Um, welcome, and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Um, we appreciate you making time in your schedules um, to join us. Um, to provide a basis for much of our discussion today, we wanted to first go through some highlights as they pertain to the field of neuropsychology and provide some higher level background as to the development of the field as an independent discipline. At its core, neuropsychology relies upon um, an interdisciplinary collaboration to uh, evaluate, describe, and diagnose the interrelatedness between uh, the brain and cognitive and behavioral manifestations. Um, the two main fields that really draw uh, into neuropsychology in, in regards to its practice are neurology and psychology. Um, however, there are other fields and areas of science that also contribute, but these are the two main uh, areas. Um, the idea about the brain-behavior connection dates way back and can be observed in early works of Rene Descartes or, or even Aristotle. However, the more tangible evidence that would lay the groundwork for the discipline began to emerge with the works of um, Paul Broca in the mid-19th century. Paul Broca, who was a French physician, was the um, first one to demonstrate the idea of functional localization and brain anatomy. Um, Broca revealed um, through his experiments uh, that patients with non-fluent aphasia had corresponding brain lesions um, in the anterior left hemisphere of the brain. And this was really the first time that someone related um, language with a specific area in the brain. And then shortly afterwards, Carl Wernicke, who was a German physician um, at the time, continued uh, to build on Broca's line of research and identified other areas of, of brain localization for language deficits as well. Um, his discovery of receptive aphasia, uh, which correlated to lesions found in the left posterior region of the temporal lobe, um, continued to build on this idea of language and uh, its relation to um, specific brain structures. Also during this time, we had um, observed an American physician named Robert Bartholo who conducted experiments. Um, uh, he conducted an experiment on a woman who um, actually had her brain exposed due to a cancerous ulcer. And Bartholo applied electrical current stimulation directly to this woman's brain and observed various physical movements as well as a variety of um, emotional responses as well. Uh, the woman was observed to be crying when he uh, uh, touched certain areas of the dura. Um, I would note that during this time, his experiments uh, were viewed as um, unethical and criticized by the American Medical Association, although um, uh, Bartholo did continue to practice and continue on in his research. From this point onward, there were many more advances that paved the way to further refine the understanding of the cause and effect relationship between the brain and behavior and personality. The understanding of the functional organization of the brain continues to this day, um, and we continue to look to refine our understanding of that. Um, advances in technology have greatly advanced in the development of the field. Um, and two of the most prominent advances, um, I would argue, are in the areas of neuropsychological testing and neuroimaging. Okay. Two of the main types of imaging available um, as it relates to neuropsychology really are structural imaging and functional imaging. And it's really functional imaging that is most often utilized to assist in neuropsychological assessment. Um, this functional imaging allows for a finer scale in regards to metabolic functioning. Oftentimes, um, research will even involve the subject um, to perform various neuropsychological tests concurrently with imaging scans, such as a functional MRI. Um, you, there's been occasions where they will put the subject or the patient into the MRI um, scanning machine and the patient will be able to see above them, either through a mirror or some other type of device, um, a cognitive or neuropsychological test set before them and they will respond to uh, the stimulus on the screens, either verbally or by you know pushing a button with their finger and then different areas of their uh, 
brain activity will light up on the scan. Um, so it, it's all kinds of uses. All right. Apart from neuroimaging uh, procedures, neuropsychological testing is a way for neuropsychology practitioners to measure brain functioning as it relates to structure and processing. This type of testing um, is often done or should be done in a controlled clinical setting and allows for the diagnosis of deficits. It has implications for both treatment um, and research as well. Of note is um, Alexander Loria. He was a Russian neuropsychologist who played a major role in defining neuropsychology um, as it's practiced and recognized today. In, in 1962, Loria published uh, his textbook, um, Higher Cortical Functions in Man, and it was this textbook and, and his research that really set the stage for the modern concept of neuropsychology as an independent discipline. Um, other research which followed uh, continued to emphasize the importance of using standardized psychometric tests to guide the systematic observation of the brain behavior relationship. Today, uh, typical neuropsychological assessments cover a wide variety of cognitive and behavioral functioning. Um, the main categories listed on this slide are assessed through numerous standardized tests. The areas cover intellectual functioning, language, memory, executive functioning, um, perception, motor skills, um, and in many cases, um, they will neuropsychological batteries will also include some component of personality assessment. When considering neuropsychological assessment or testing, there are several challenges that um, we face. And two of the main challenges we face in any neuropsychological assessment.